our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. And we used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Everybody, better late than never. I'm so sorry that this was an hour delayed, but uh, I blame the Los Angeles government, the California <laughs> government, the LA County government that makes it impossible to drive across this st this city. It makes it impossible. I, I would have had better time, and I've said this a million times, on a horse. Uh, it was two hours to get from Essentially, how far was that away? 12 miles away, something like that? I have no this idea. This is not New York City. This is not New York City where people are trying to go 10 blocks and they can either walk or take a train. We're going, you know, 15 miles on on average, I'd say. And the the roads don't work. It's just, it's just insane. It's really ridiculous. I'd forgotten about how miserable this city is and I hadn't driven across it in quite some time. And I realize now why I avoid it so... But you had to go. Assiduously. You had yeah, to go. Yeah, I had to go... Um, and it was no problem, and I did everything I needed to do. Um, so here we are, an hour late. And let's uh, hope it all turns out good. I yes. found out I need a root canal today. So if you had a bad day, and well, actually, I didn't have the root right, canal. Right, you should have had the root canal. Well, then you I know, would have had the better day. <laughs> so you see, that's where we really see. Screwed I didn't up have it, but I found when out I have to get it. When are you going to have it? Because that's when my this it's clouds already, are going to clear. I've already for got me. a root canal, so uh, they, it's not really like no, no, seriously, where they have what, to what? like put the new root take everything out it's just they have to fix a old one when are you gonna do it she told me i looked young she i go she goes how long have you had it and i go like i don't know 15 20 years she goes what you're that old i thought you oh. were like 40. Uh, uh. <laughs> i was like oh, thank you that, well you went for a good reason i know so uh, i had a good day <laughs> and what day are you actually getting it done tuesday hopefully okay. will it bother me when i'm traveling to austin the next day no i don't think so hopefully not but we'll to be see. fair that's when things will clear for me so tuesday the clouds will clear for me and <laughs> they will they will accumulate for susan they will they will gather for susan i you know i the last time i had a root canal i was i just started menopause i didn't know it and um the it was when Howard Stern used to be really raunchy. Mm. So the guy would put like the headphones on and the, and you know, turn, you know, give you the gas and everything. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to it, Howard Stern and actually being able to get through the root canal because he was, his show was just so disgusting. He was like having a root canal to your ears. Yes. I, it, it distracted me. So. But I was like, what is he saying? This was back in, you know, 20 years ago. So he's, he, it wouldn't do it. I can't. It's not going to work anymore. Well, we were out on Clubhouse as well. If you guys want to ask questions of our guest or me, we will set that up in just mere moments. But let me, before you bring our guest in here, let me tell you all about her. Michelle Ward, a PhD in clinical neuroscience, focused on predatory criminals. I know the the preoccupation with murder porn is it, it's a, quite a high clip. Susan, why do you think people get, so, particularly women, get so preoccupied with murder porn? What? You know how people get preoccupied with these the, the Jody Arias's and the oh Casey I didn't know I didn't know what you were talking murder about murder porn that's what, uh, yeah. that's what South Park calls uh, right. all the preoccupation oh, oh, okay um, because it's just I mean it's sort of like the the case we're watching now you know with Amber Heard it's just uh -huh. like you know thank God she didn't die but um, it's just the trickiness of women you know <laughs> and how we how did she and what about that other one who is the other one that um That's not fantastic. jody Harris, but the other one who had the casey husband, anthony casey anthony with the baby the, the right trickiness of women yeah yeah i think we're we're like well why do women most like looking at that and watching that kind of stuff it's hard to explain isn't it um maybe because they secretly hate women, hit men. Ooh. I don't know. Oh, okay. I I don't know. I don't know. Don't they, well, they often me. women sit in judgment of women. I don't I'm, really get into that stuff. I know, like, that's not I know. my thing. It's no, not. I, I don't have enough estrogen. No. So so uh, you can follow Michelle on Dr. Doctor Michelle Ward. And Michelle's with two L and E. Michelle Ward W A R D. Uh, she she uh, let's see where else the the new podcast and that's what she's here to, to raise awareness about is the mind of a monster. Oh no no I beg your pardon I beg your pardon hold on hold on hold on. 
Oh my gosh! I know you got to get your head together here. I know I just jumped too much off. traffic. I jumped off the freeway. <laughs> How not we're... to raise a serial killer? There it is. There. How not to raise a serial killer? Yeah, that's a good book. No, it's a it's not a podcast. book. It's a podcast. And that's she's, awesome. Yeah, the 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 mind of a monster was a, a podcast she did for Investigation Discovery. She hosted many things on ID, uh, Discovery ID. Uh, you'll recognize her from that. Uh, and let's bring Michelle in. Michelle, good to see you. Hi, thanks for having me. Hey there. So what did you yeah, make uh, of uh, Susan's assessment? Uh, why, why women uh, like watching the murder porn? It's funny because I'm like, I have some ideas, but I don't think anyone truly knows. So I kind of liked her guesses. Mm. I mean, I think it's probably because we are typically the victims of these types of crimes. So I think it's mm. part of us, we want to understand it, but we also want the tips to avoid it. And I think the more you understand it, the more you're like, okay, I, I cannot do that with that victim dead, or I can do this. And that's my theory. And Michelle studied predatory behavior and psycho psychopathy and has a lot of experience with this stuff. Why don't, why don't we, we're going to go down the psychopath path here, you and I. Um, okay. I just love Susan's I'm assessment that it's there. It's a... <laughs> It's an, under, it's an interest in the trickiness of women. There's a lot packed into that idea of the trickiness of women. Uh, but I, it's very comical. Be honest, but nothing else. That's right. Tricky. Uh, and so- Takes one to know one. How, uh, how would you characterize psychopathy and why it interests you? Let's sort of start with simple stuff. And then we're gonna talk about how not to raise a psychopath. Well, I, I mean, psychopathy in general or violent crime, it's so abhorrent and it's aberrant. So, it's such an unusual personality disorder or personality type and crime in general. We, most of us cannot conceive of these crimes. We could never commit them ourselves. So for me, it's like, who the hell can, why are you so different from everybody else? And that was what that was in the nascency. That was the impetus for me studying psychopathy. But then I thought, well, it can't all be trauma. It can't all be childhood trauma because then everybody from a war torn country or every abused kid, would become criminal. We'd have generations of crimes uh, or, or criminal behavior from like, you know, war torn places, the Balkans. So I'm like, what are the individual differences? And it turned out there were a few people studying the biology and the genetic underpinnings of violent crime, some of them specifically psychopathy. And that's what I ended up doing. And so the, there is a strong genetic biological component. Uh, and, and I think we were, you and I have spoken before that, that there's sort of necessary and sufficient elements in becoming a, a, a problematic psychopath. So it's having this genetic or biological burden, and then then you add in some bad childhood, and now you got the mix right. It's so true. I mean, you, psychopaths are all among us, and everyone associates them with being serial killers, but very few psychopaths ever commit a murder. Typically, they become, you know, maybe the head of a bank, or they run a different company, or they become your surgeon. And in some cases they run countries and evolutionarily yeah. they're not burdened by the guilt and the remorse and, and those things, those emotions that hold us down from doing things. So if you want a, you know, a bomb detonator, if you want somebody who can be a trauma surgeon, sometimes those, or, or <laughs> win or lose your money on the stock market, sometimes you need those traits. So the trick is making sure you are a pro-social psychopath and not an anti-social psychopath. It's the anti-social psychopaths right. who can murder. And, and the pro-social social psychopaths um, can be very, very useful, such as your favorite pro-social psychopath? Yeah, Bill Clinton. I love that guy. <laughs> and, and Susan, you've always said there was something like that oh, going on yeah. with him. And so Michelle just says it right out. Oh no, he's just pro, that's funny. He, he's a pro-social psychopath. That's well, it. You, they gave the uh, psychopath test at your mom's house to everybody over there, right? Uh, I did it. Or just, I, I, or I just it. our people. Uh, I gave it to no, just a few, I gave it on the air to like the boys and to you. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to find out if I'm a psychopath, you have to go over there. She, we were giving yeah. her some shit. Don't about tell. It. We were giving her some grief about some of her behavior, and I said, "Let's find out if you're a psychopath. <laughs> Maybe that's why you behave like that." <laughs> you and so, don't don't this. spoil it. You got to listen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just use I use a, a very pretty simple, uh, you know, sort of available. Did, online was anybody stuff. close to being a psychopath over there? Oh, any, any, any for any, sure. Yeah, okay, any, all right. Had a lot of that stuff. He really had sociopath stuff going on, and his was really. But you could kind of zero it in all around trauma. Really was around trauma for him because he. And what's interesting about his stuff, somebody on the, a show I do called After Dark, he, um, 
I started really talking to him about, look, this is because we did some trauma scales or something. I don't remember what we did, but it became pretty clear that trauma was a major component for him. And I said, we, we can treat this. Let's do this. And he was like very interested in it. And he was starting to make appointments. Then he had to move to a different city. And he goes, and now his position is, I was just bullshitting you. I never intended to see it. Which, which is simply not true. Sociopath. Oh, yeah. Right. That's that psychopathic? Yeah, that oh. sounded psychopathic to me too. I was like, wait a minute now, come on, don't do that. But I don't know if, you know, we'll find out. I'm going to push it. It's a fine line between sociopathy and psychopath, well, right? Well, go ahead, Michelle. That, that is absolutely true. And people have all kinds of arguments about that. Yeah. For wait, research, say that again, we couldn't hear it. For yeah. research purposes, we use those terms interchangeably. One, yeah. one of the yeah. terms came out of... England and the other one came here and we used to make no distinction at all. So the construct itself is the same. Um, so I always use the term psychopathy because that's what I was trained on, but it's generally the same thing. It really does not delineate between pro-social and anti-social psychopathy. You're describing the same person, the same traits. Now, see, for me, a, a like a, a problematic psychopath really doesn't have feelings, right? They just pretend to have feelings, kind of. Isn't that sort of what they're doing? A real psychopath, no? They have some feelings. They have, it's blunted. Mm -hmm. Their emotions are blunted and their affect is blunted, but they do have some feelings. What they don't have are some very important feelings, and that is guilt, right. and remorse. And they just, they just don't mm -hmm. have it, or empathy. And that's, you know, if you don't have mm -hmm. empathy, you can kind of do anything. Right. And, and that, that, that's how I, I always see sociopaths my, in my own mind. I, I see a lot of people that you know, are addicts and sociopathic in their behavior. And, and they have lots of feelings many times and can be very sort of interesting people, but they only see others as something for their use and entertainment. And so you they, and they just, that's that. it. That, you look in the orbit. Go ahead. A psychopath yeah. or a sociopath. Everybody in their orbit serves them somehow, has a purpose or a role. They're, they're being used essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That which and and you know, it's funny. I've told this story before that you know one of the important things about having a team when you're treating in a psychiatric setting is each of our personality construct came to bear on our ability to connect with and help other personality problems that came in the door. Uh, and it, it's just whatever it is that about us, you know, you, you, and, and how we react to those different personalities is exquisitely diagnostic. So we had like my, my charge nurse found psychopaths and sociopaths to be incredibly entertaining and funny. So whenever she would say, oh my God, he's so funny. We just go, oh shit, here we go. The guy's a psychopath. And we were never wrong, never wrong. And, uh, he, even it would even whittle down to like bipolar disorder. Like my partner had a real connection and they loved him if they had bipolar disorder. And I sort of did good with a lot of the trauma survivors, the borderline, that kind of stuff. They, they, whatever, you know, I could, and, and I was fine with them. I, you know, I could work with them. It, it didn't, it didn't send me running out the back door as, as some of these personalities do if, if you're a different personality type trying to work with them. So it's really interesting to me how much our own stuff uh, in, in, is involved in working with patients? Well, for me, I'm just lazy. And so I had to pick what <laughs> would keep my interest and keep me working because, I mean, if it was boring, I just couldn't do it. So I found psychopaths to be interesting enough to keep my attention long enough to get the damn PhD. Th that, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, about as far down the, uh, or up the entertainment scale as you can go. I mean, I suppose there are other weird, you know, sort of OCD behaviors that might be entertaining and and, and stimulating, but uh, the psychopathy is the one that, uh, you know, where you see some of the wildest stuff. But you had mentioned to me one time that uh, a psychopath is a more evolved form of the human being. Explain. It can be argued that it's a more evolved form of a human being. And that is because it's, like I said earlier, it's not, that person's not burdened by guilt, remorse, and empathy. So they can, can attain their goals better than we can. And if you think about that, a, a whole world of psychopaths was not, would not be a great place. Everybody, it would destroy itself. But having them sprinkled among empaths and regular people, they can achieve a lot. And we need them. We need people who will you know, do the tough stuff, the stuff that make the hard decisions. You and I have talked about the trolley experiment so many times. 
we need people who will make the right decision despite the loss, the guilt, the, the, the consequences of it. I, I mean, I am the opposite of a psychopath. I wouldn't be good in those positions, but I'm glad right. that we have some of them. Right. In, in the, how does it, it is, these are sort of narcissistic disorders. Um, nar, you know, I, I always think in terms of when you're saying these people that have evolutionary advantages to them, uh, I always think about a fighter pilot, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, the fighter pilot has to feel grandiose, invincible, not have anxiety, uh, special, all those things that narcissists feel. Is it sufficient to be a narcissist to be a good spider, a fighter pilot, or do you have to be a full on psychopath? <laughs> You gotta call my cousin. He's a fighter pilot. He's pretty <laughs> confident. Um, so, yeah. narcissism. All psychopaths have an element of narcissism. They have to in order to right. take a clinical level. Narcissists are not necessarily psychopaths. So you see that it's it's like a narcissist, but who doesn't care about other people. It's right, narcissism right. who really, really doesn't care, really doesn't care. Right. So it's like a malignant narcissist, really. And it's like and, a malignant and, narcissist. and I think. Yeah, and I think narcissists can, generally speaking, have anxiety. But psychopaths don't have anxiety. They just don't really have it, right? Well, they have low autonomic arousal, period. And, and there's an argument that that's why they are thrill seekers and they commit crimes. So in my podcast, I talk about if you have a child with some of these tendencies, psychopathic tendencies, don't freak out. You might have, a, you might have an Elon Musk. Or I, I don't know if he's a psychopath. But my argument is if you can stimulate them, so low autonomic arousal, they have lower resting heart rates, they have low skin conductance, they do not experience, so that, and that's uncomfortable to have that low autonomic arousal. But in addition to that, they don't experience anticipatory fear like we do. So if they're going to be shocked mm. in 10 seconds and you show them a countdown, psychopaths don't increase their sweating, they don't, their heart rate doesn't increase, their digestion doesn't change. They're just like, yeah, okay, I'm waiting. Children, psychopathic children have that same somatic marker. They, they don't experience anticipatory fear either. So you end up with a thrill seeker. So they're looking for something to do to get, get excited and they're not worried about the consequences. They're not fearful of being caught. Right. So my argument is if you, a lot of times the psychopaths in low income areas, what, what, how are they gonna get a thrill? They're gonna go steal stuff. But if you have mm -hmm. the resources and you can take your little fledgling psychopath and nudge them toward pro-social stuff, put them in sports, let them run their own little lemonade stand, their own little business. Let them manipulate, not in the classroom, not their peers, but let them have that thrill in something pro-social. I mean, base climbers often have this low autonomic arousal. Thrills, thrill seekers in general are gonna benefit from parents who let them seek their thrills in pro-social ways. So I have a, a um, colleague who has a resting heart rate of 45 or something we always tell him that he has um hyper hyper vigilance that he he because he has no arousal he sees things and is sensitive to patterns and things that the rest of us are sort of missing and uh he spends his time uh, uh driving race cars uh so adam carolla has some of that at least yeah. that biological stuff we call that you associate whether or not he and he's super pro-social he's like way way down the the, the um, road with his with his compass you know on morality and he describes it as just a math equation so I, I don't know if I told you I did the the um, I did the trolley experiment with him and I said okay now you got to throw somebody off the bridge to save the five people on the on uh, in the trolley and, and he goes yeah, no problem and I said well now you're standing next to somebody and it's your son you're gonna tr you're gonna send him on the track you're gonna throw him on the track he goes yeah it's unfortunate he's the one there it's just a math equation he's got to go i was like what, what are you talking about how can you even, how can you say that now when i brought it to his attention he was sort of like oh yeah i guess you know i'm not really thinking about it you know the way i should perhaps but that he could you know that math was just all he really thought about in in moral equations was telling well and he's pragmatic and practical about it there is a right answer yeah, yeah. and there is a wrong answer yeah. and he's giving you the right yeah. answer I don't think I've had a conversation with you about psychopathy without his name coming up. 
<laughs> That's hysterical. That is hysterical. Well, he, he, but we both admit that we like pro-social psychopaths, right? I mean, it's something we, you and I like. Uh, like, I think Bill Clinton was a great president. I really admire everything he did. He did some shitty stuff to Monica Lewinsky, and but that was the psychopathy. That's the liability of having that that system. Going what about through. Tom Segura? Uh, I think a lot of Tom is kind of a, an act a little bit. Yeah. He does not really know. He actually feels things a lot. He's tough. Christina? No. No. <laughs> but I but I know what you're talking about. They they're both what I would just call tough. And but I think they have lots of feelings about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah, and, and they, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I I don't know that I could characterize them on a pathological uh sort of spectrum. Um I guess comedians don't count cuz they're just trying to be funny too. Well, well, how about comedians? Do they tend to be more in this well, camp? I wanted to ask you about comedians when we spoke before. I have been told that comedians are the most depressed people on the planet and that they can be. their coping is, is comedy. I was in a, yeah. in a meditation training once and, and he said his biggest clients were celebrity comedians and they are the darkest, saddest, most depressed people. And I'm like, well, that's it, horrifying. I, I, I would argue... Them, well, I, there, there's a lot packed into that. And I've talked to a, known a lot of them, talked to a lot of them. And the dark, for sure, they have a darkness about them. And, the, and their view of themselves in the world is kind of dark. And there's a sociopathic instinct in how they look the world and attack the world, right? That's sort of making fun of uh, everybody and everything. Um, historically, there's been a lot of depression. I mean, you don't have to go further than the the classic sort of tears of a clown, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a trope, right? That the clown is out, you know, Pagliacci is actually, you know, stricken and, but, but I'm not sure I, I, and they have, there's a lot of bipolar and there's a lot of substance and there's a lot of trauma, but, but I couldn't really with all the ones I know, and maybe it's the fact that comedians have become the new rock stars in a certain way. They, they don't strike me as strictly speaking depressive. Because they they never have episodes where they can't go out and work or can't get in front of class. They, they they will use substances and then get depressed or substances and then get manic. But I don't I don't really experience them as um, a lot of trauma, a lot of that kind of stuff. So obviously there can be some mood instability. But I, I and I know what you're talking about. But the darkness I think is what people sort of are responding to. They have a they have a and some of them are darker than others. You said yeah. earlier when I spoke to you at a different time that you believe alcoholics or substance abuse, or I'm not sure if it was alcoholics or, or substance yeah. in general, yeah. that they are yeah. more evolved than the rest of us. Yes. Oh, I'm not so, I'm correct. Evolved. So, so for, for some of the same reasons that you've already pointed out. So, and, and again, there's a lot of overlap with these character phenomenon and substances too, right? We, we, they they kind of go together. But, but for sure, people with alcoholism and addiction, which is basically the same genetic construct, just what, what your drug of choice is, is sort of more the, the context of your biology acting out than something unique about your biology. And we'll just use alcoholism as the placeholder, right? Because that's the one that's been around the longest. When you look at parts of the globe where alcoholism has emerged, like really sort of purified in the population, you find it most obviously in isolated populations because that's where you know that's where genes come out right if somebody's on an island or somebody's up in Scotland yeah. and multi-generational military assault seems to be the ingredient so extreme circumstances over multiple generations and you start to see this gene emerge well that suggests that those were the people better able to survive in these extraordinary circumstances of military activity and I, I took that and I used to use it all the time. I still do it to this day. When I speak to groups of addicts and alcoholics, uh, I will go, hey, what if, a, a, what if a bunch of Huns came over the hill? You saw them coming over the hill here. What would you guys want to do? And nearly to a person, they'll go, I'm pick something up and I'd go at them. Now, that is not a non-alcoholic impulse. <laughs> that, is, that, is, right. that is sort of a, right. So evidently in these extreme chronic military circumstances, fighting has a superior outcome to getting a spear in your back running away, which is what would happen to me and you. And so, so they, and, and they're, but then when they don't have all the stimulation 
that's when they have anxiety and their moods are unstable and they start looking for things to to fix that and that's when they get going um but it it's it's a pretty universal phenomenon and and you know the somebody needs to study the overlap with narcissism and psychopathy because that stuff is there but in my world it's it seems like it's mostly there as a result of childhood trauma i wouldn't because because addicts alcoholics have very rich emotional landscapes usually very rich they, these are it's not so people that aren't having feelings that how, how they're, they're trying to deal they're trying to deal with they're trying to deal with their feelings they're too intense too prolonged too sensitive and and their landscape is you know very rich as a result but they can't manage it so they use to try to try to regulate it's so it, i mean speaking of like you know genetic predispositions toward alcoholism and then this rich landscape it's the protective factors and you and i've spoken about this before that protects somebody who's experienced a ton of trauma from becoming an alcoholic right. or a serial killer. What are, mm -hmm. what are those? And I think if we can study and isolate protective factors, we could actually do a lot mm -hmm. more. I talk about this on how not to raise a serial killer as well. We can do a lot more to help and, and eliminate some, there's always gonna be crime. But if we can eliminate some of the crime, then we're all doing a good job. And I think that even, even with among people we know, even ourselves, what protected us? What protects somebody from not taking that trauma and going on a different trajectory? Yeah, so Susan, uh, uh, Michelle had a colorful mom also. And uh, that's mostly what she, we, she and I talk about on the Dr. Drew podcast, which you'll see in, a, in a, you can watch in about two months or listen in about two months. You're leaning in, Susan. Okay, tell me more. Oh, <laughs> well, do you want to tell oh, Michelle? Michelle? Susan knows my stories inside and out. M Michelle, yours? You want to share a little bit of We're not going to go too far down this path, but go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, my mom was, I mean, she was a very loving mom, but it was, she had some emotional instability. She looked a lot like a borderline. And it's interesting to me because anytime I talk to somebody or tell them I'm the child of a borderline, they're like, well, why aren't you an alcoholic or a cutter? Why are you okay? And I always come back to, well, protective factors. And we know some protective factors, like having a higher IQ, having good friends, having a good environment. I think there's some genetic protective, in fact, protective factors. But I'm so curious about if no one tends to study this, like what is it? You can pull somebody with you know, complicated backgrounds and abuse and even genetically related to people who are complicated and then they turn out just fine. And I'm always curious about what yeah. it is. I mean, you both had three children at the exact same time, environment yeah. arguably the same, and they're all pretty yep. different, right? Very. Susan? Yeah. 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 Very different. So yes, there's genetic. We we can see the genetic stuff playing out all over the place. And and by the way, but they I'll, haven't changed since they were born. And I'll let Susan comment right. on this the the male the male female stuff, obvious from from birth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like Pauline went straight for the pink boas, and the boys went for the trains. And we, we didn't. Tr and we tried to <clears throat> do otherwise. We didn't give them a lot of toys when they were really little. We let them, and then we took them to a toy shop and let them go. There was we didn't go. Oh yeah, you go over here. You go over there. They just ran. And, and you couldn't pull them away. You could not pull them away from their, uh, you know, and they were like eight months old, and you could not get them to go to look at something else. It was trains and hammers. And then all this sort of, I just remember that wall that Paulina was messing with of boas and shoes and stuff. And that was it. High heels. They could barely speak. They could barely crowns. talk. They could barely talk. They could barely had language yet. Lots of pink. Yeah, it was lots of pink and red. And that's and what I would argue. There it was. I mean, say it again? The way they come out, I mean, we can nudge them as yeah. parents. We can nudge within their personality type. We can protect them from trauma so we don't give them giant risk factors. And again, we tacitly pass down our genes, which may help them or hurt them. We don't know, you know, which means we can't also take credit for everything great they do because some of that's just genetic. But within their personality types, we have power. We can nudge, mm. but we cannot take Paulina and make her obsessed with hammers and trucks and take the boys and make them obsessed with whatever Paulina was obsessed with. It just isn't, it's not that simplistic. We give ourselves too much credit and power as parents and we give ourselves too much blame. So for me, the whole point is like, where are the areas that we can protect? Where are the areas we can nudge? Other than protecting them from big trauma, what can we do? And that to me is where that, that 
fine line is um, to not end up with a psychopath. Or, or you're going to have a psychopath. And that is a serial psychopath. Thus the, thus the podcast. And like what I've spent my whole life. I mean, one of the things, Drew, and I want to know your opinion about this. When I would go on air, I had those two shows, um, Stalked and The Mind of a Murderer, when I'd go on those shows and talk about like brain differences or reasons these people killed, the viewers didn't like it. They wanted everyone they got angry, to have yeah. the same yeah. and punish it because they knew right from wrong. Yeah. So I didn't do a lot of talk yeah. time about talking about all these things that we know about what causes crime and what can prevent crime. In a podcast, I can do whatever yes. I want. But what is it about the consumers of true crime where they don't want to know, uh, they want to know the why, but they don't want to take away free will from the killer. They want the killer to have known right from wrong and to be punished accordingly. Right. So uh, because the whether you believe there is or is not actual free will, everyone wants to believe that they have free will, everyone. And anything that gets near sort of even addressing the, you know, how much free will do we really have? People hate. And so when I was doing the HLN show and we did a lot of crime stuff, I'm sure you, you got this exact same feedback that I got, which is, I don't understand why you just don't understand there's evil and she's evil. There's just evil. You don't talk about evil. It's like, yeah, that, that's, that is such a conflation of really kind of, yes, there, there are horrible people that do horrible things. And, and there are some people I would characterize as evil that really don't have feelings that actually you've studied that actually get um, pleasure from hurting other people. And yeah, that's evil. That's rare. And lots of people do bad things in the meantime. That's right. And if you are born with a biological difference, or if you do have a tumor in your orbital frontal area of your brain that causes changes, mm -hmm. are you, are we all created equal? And, and legally the ramifications, if I, if I have damage to my prefrontal cortex because I was a boxer, I got dropped on my head. Am I as mm -hmm. responsible for my behavior as you? Viewers hate that. Right. And, and here's how I, I conceptualize it. So this is sort of how I rationalize this which is no. However, you like, like I tell my addict patients, you, you're not responsible for being an alcoholic addict. You're responsible for your treatment. You're responsible for your treatment. So at the moment you realize there's something going on that you're not the same as everybody else, or you have a liability, that's where you get treatment. And if you don't, and you drive your car and you kill somebody, that's it. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now that's when the legal system steps in. So you are not responsible for your illness. You are responsible for your recovery and treatment. And the people that deny and refuse. Now there's a there is a weird uh complicating factor, which is, you know, sort of commonly called denial, but I'll just call it anisognosia, which is this inability to see what's going on, which is people are getting so seriously mentally ill now. We're seeing a lot of that. That's why people sit on the streets and go, I'm living my best life, you know, and, and then people co-sign that. That's anisognosia. That's that's lack of ability to see what the illness is doing. And that's a problem. I still think people have an obligation at a certain point when they start having outlying behavior to listen to somebody. Even if they don't mm -hmm. see why, they have to kind of take some direction if it's clear that not taking direction will hurt themselves or somebody else. You know, in the, the lower income areas, there have been studies like the nurse study where they go in and they take women who are pregnant, who don't have a lot of resources, and they just send a nurse in every month to meet with them and educate them on stopping smoking while you're pregnant, reduce alcohol consumption. And then once the baby's born, nutrition, meeting the social and emotional needs of the infant. And they would go every month while they're pregnant. And then they went for 23 months afterward. And then they visited with those kids until they were 17. And it, they expected better outcome from the for the infants, but what turned out was the moms did so much better. Just that accountability of that nurse coming mm -hmm. into their home once a month to, to weigh their baby to make sure that the, the mm -hmm. pregnant mom is eaten, and then once the baby's there, the nutrition for the baby is adequate. That changed the trajectory of the so those children. I can I actually have the statistics. Those children had a fifty two percent reduction in arrests. 91% reduction in tru truancy and destruction of property, 63% mm -hmm. reduction in convictions than their, their, their placebo counterparts control group. But what was so interesting, and this, we have these, this program happens now, the nurse study program, it was 
in Los Angeles, only 4% of the people who need it get it. But the, the amount of money that is saved by early intervention and not letting the, those kids clog up the prisons, if we could take some of that funding and, and shove it into these programs, you would, it would all balance out and we wouldn't have the recidivism and this overpopulation in the prisons that we have. But unfortunately, it just doesn't get that much traction. We'll talk about nutrition and uh, intrauterine exposure and early childhood. And you've, you've told me some things about omega fatty acids. Yeah, they're important. They're important all the time. Um, you asked me an interesting question about how much, and I don't know, but some of these, most of these studies tried to get one gram of a omega acid into or omega threes into the children three times a week. And in every study, in every population and at every stage of life, there is a reduction in aggression or criminal behavior. So could even that be, could, could that be the same phenomenon where they may be watched by a research assistant or a nurse every few weeks while they gave them those uh, omega-3? Could it be the so, participation of another human more than the, the fatty acids? You know, it's unclear, but but what what some of these studies did they implemented it in the school that they were already in. So it was mm. a, a preschool. Half the kids were given lunch, physical exercise, and cognitive stimulation. So they had particular puzzles. And, and that it's hard to disentangle how much of that was the omega-3s. But they did try to control for it is just the giving it to the mom, like the smart fish drink I told you about with one study. They just gave it to the mom to give to the kid. They tried to control for everything else. This nurse study mm. is different because the nurse is coming into your home. But these omega-3 right. studies, just adding the omega-3 to your environment as it is. Crazy. Uh, I yeah. think people are, I, I'm watching I'm watching the chat on our restream here. I think people are getting confused about some of the terms and things we're using. Talk okay. about monozygotic twins and what that tell us about resiliency and genetics. And Because people are like, is it nature or nurture? Uh, it's, it's both, everybody. Oh. It's always both. But but go ahead and talk about monozygotic twins. And then I think we need to define again what psychopathy is because people are getting confused. So go ahead. Sure. So a lot of this research is done with twin studies. And the reason we use twin studies is because you can have two types of twins. Identical twins, which we call monozygotic, those are genetically almost 100% the same. They share 100% of their non-segregating genes. For practical purposes, they're little clones of each other. Dizygotic or fraternal twins share 50% of their genes, just like regular brothers and sisters born at the same time. So if you take those groups and study them for any behavior, any reading ability, hyperactivity, criminal behavior, you can isolate how much of the, that behavior is driven by genes versus environment. Because you know these two, this group shares 100% of their genes, and this group shares only 50% of their genes. It becomes very useful for studying how much of anything is genetic. We used to take identical twins who were separated at birth, but evidently that's rude. We're not supposed to do that to children. I don't know why, just kidding. Um, we don't separate identical twins anymore and adopt them out to different homes. They get adopted together as they should. So twin studies are our next best bet with that. Yeah, I just realized that I have not shared some of the all the alcohol addiction studies are done. Were done on monozygotic twins, and the incidence of alcoholism addiction is the same regardless of the environment in which they are raised. It's it's a genetic potential that gets activated, and the the severity of the illness is something more about environment that kind of thing. Um, but I, I want to tell you a quick story about a guy named a researcher down at UC San Diego named Mark Shuckett who came to the, did a bunch of studies, and his way of saying the genetic potential for alcoholism, he would say it to, to be as, as, as accurate as possible. He said, 60% of the disease of alcoholism is accounted for on the basis of genetics alone. 60% is accounted for on the basis of genetics. Then he had a great study where he took like 200 or 250 sons of alcoholic fathers and tried to see if he could figure traits that were predictive of likelihood of developing alcoholism. And he studied everything. And you know, when I go to, again, rooms of addicts, I'll go, what, what do you think the trait was? And I'll go, sleep disturbances, sensitivity, you know, feeling different than, you know, they'll have all kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, they'll have all kinds of stuff. Well, it turns out the only factor he could find that was predictive was resistant to alcohol intoxication. 
So if you're somebody that could drink your peers under the table, Michelle, make take note. And if you're somebody to drink your peers <laughs> under the table, uh, that was a marker for the risk. So then he asked the question, huh, I wonder if other mammalian systems have a similar resistance to alcohol intoxication. Mm -hmm. And he found it in every mammalian system he could find. All the way, he took it all the way down to insects. The, the fruit fly had it. The Drosophila had it. So he developed this instrument he called an inebriometer, which was a chamber that he could pump alcohol vapors into. And the flies would, you know, respond accordingly. They would get drunk or not drunk. Well, he said there were, there as soon as he put the, the vapors in, there was a population of flies that would drop out immediately. And they had a specific gene, and they actually named that gene cheap date. So they had the cheap no. date gene. And yes. And then the then there was a group that continued to fly around long after all the rest. And they took them out and they had one of two genetic things. They either had a proline, a single amino acid substitution in the GABA A receptor. And I think you understand that GABA is a very important system in alcoholism addiction. So their GABA A receptor was different by one single amino acid. And their serotonin transporter was LL allele, which is another thing that's important in mood disturbances and things like that. So he went back to the sons of alcoholic fathers, and lo and behold, the, the presence of one of those genes conferred about a 60% probability of developing the disease of alcoholism. But there was something like five of, the, of these kids that had both, and they had 100% probability of alcoholism. 100%. Nothing. So isn't that, it's a great story about some of the genetic, you know, phenomenon of how we study them. Isn't that interesting? I, I'm just obsessed with the fact that there's a man out there who got flies drunk. I, I mean, you kind of lost me at that moment. I'm like, <laughs> He's, I thought, well, I and, and he, cool. <laughs> I've gotten a few drunk in my kitchen on, on red wine when Susan, I try to get rid of them. Susan gets them drunk to get them to fall into the wine and drown. <laughs> That's her plan, her evil, evil plan. That's how I killed them. Yeah. And how about and they always go for it. I always thought it was, he was a great researcher, and he he had such you know clever comedic you know the inebriometer and this cheap date gene and all this stuff. It was a very entertaining speaker. But I, I, I but I, there are many other. Now we've been able to sort of isolate groups of genes with alcoholism that that come into importance at different stages of the illness. You know, there, there's things that they're changing. You know, genes that are being turned in on on and off as the illness becomes more chronic. And, um, you know, things that make it more difficult for people to stop, frankly, the longer the exposure. Um, and this is sort of the... I have, the I have a follow-up question to that. People who seek treatment, are they different in, in terms of genetics or, or just type of alcoholics than people who resist treatment? Yeah. Yeah. Because you're studying... So, uh, uh, let me just... Uh, yeah, yes. Correct. I'll answer that in a second. The, the the system that kicks in later in the day is called the allostatic system, where people can't can't regulate it at all. Um, so, are is is somebody that comes to treatment different than somebody else? Well, let's the the person that would typically come to treatment was either just had a near death experience, like they really just escaped dying, and that motivated them. They were sent by the courts. That motivated them. They were sent by their family, okay, and that motivated them because the family was going to leave if they didn't do something. Um, and then the final group is the ones that had moments of clarity. They would just have a moment where they see themselves and their illness as they actually were. And that would be the more interesting group, right? Uh, whether they had something about them that, that they could do that. I, I've studied that group, and, and there is something about them where they will typically describe, often describe, that they have a relationship with a new person in their life, not not a romantic relationship, a friendship. With uh, They would say, yeah, you know, I was hanging around with this guy that I normally, wasn't the kind of guy I would normally hang around with, but he would talk to me about things and I would, I thought, yeah, he, had, he was onto something. And they would literally see themselves through a new pair of glasses. And for addicts, they kind of, they kind of, developmentally pull back and so they can't regulate their emotions they don't get in close contact with other people and so they they stay stuck in their own view of the world and themselves their stuckness is part of the problem and when they can for a moment be seen through a new clear pair of classes many of them will describe 
literally walking past a mirror and going, oh, that's me. Like, oh, I, I hadn't seen myself. What, what have I done to myself? Oh my God, I can't believe that's me. Isn't that interesting? It's Too fascinating. Wild, right? Yeah. I wonder what that, wow. that I mean, and, and, what triggers that? Is there a particular person? Is it the specialness of the new person or is it just where they've gotten in their it, disease? It, it is it is why I became a not obsessed, but very interested in interpersonal neurobiology. The, the, it, I really would hearken back, you may not have been exposed to this stuff, but a guy named Stephen Porges has a, a biological system he called the socio-emotional exchange system based on the development of the vagal nerve system. And it essentially, um, the, the self essentially emerges in these exchanges. And when you've been walled off from those exchanges, you can't have an accurate reflection of yourself. And then when they re-enter that frame of exchange, they suddenly open to the possibility of new sort of experiences of self and emotions, and boom. That, I mean, that's what therapy really is, right? I mean, that's really all therapy is. It's just on a deeper level. This is people who have been walled off from that stuff for long periods of time, and for whatever re ever reason, suddenly kind of open themselves a little bit. It's interesting. I, I love that stuff. And, 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 and now we have some neurobiology in terms of explaining, you know, kind of how it works. And Alan Shore is another one that has worked a lot of this stuff out in terms of he, he lays a lot of emphasis on our right brains and how those right brains are embodied in our body or embedded in our bodily systems and how that are that's how where our feeling sources are and how then that is exchanged from right brain to right brain in ways that are nonverbal and maybe not even conscious. There we go. That's I'm done with my that's my diatribe for the day. Why I, I really yeah, enjoy it is that. Interesting. It's, so it's you know, you have yeah. that's a very specific sense of self. And then as as a somebody who deals with the population, I mean studying the population is very different than dealing with the population. And if in alcoholism, yes. you have comor comorbidity, I can never say that word. And that's Lots when two when two diseases or disease states or personality disorders yep. are happening at once. I have a difficult yep. time in criminal behavior disentangling the cause of crime when substance abuse is involved. Because being right. an addict makes you look a lot like a psychopath. You begin to lie, oh, absolutely. cheat, without yeah. caring yeah. about how it affects people. And so when those come yep. across my desk, I'm like, I mean, forget even just like the biosocial sense of self. What, what about just like the overarching macro? Are you a psychopath? Are you a borderline? I know you're a drunk. And now you're stealing stuff, but are you doing that to feed your addiction or because you're a criminal? It's, it becomes really nuanced. Right. Well, it's, it's very nuanced. And I will tell you, the, the, pretty much everybody comes in looking like a sociopath or a borderline. That, that's just how people enter treatment. Everyone's got those qualities. And something like 80% of them have near total remission with continued participation in treatment. Then you have to ask yourself, was that something about the nature of treatment when people's lives are on the line that they're able to actually change their personality? Because we kind of don't think that's possible, right? But maybe there's some of that involved here, or maybe it's a dialectical behavioral component that's sort of embedded in recovery that gives them enough to change what they're doing or be aware of what they're doing. It's really very, very difficult questions. But uh, I, I generally, you know, would say, you know, wait till one is well in remission before you make a second diagnosis. And even then, it's still still very hard to tell what's what. But I will tell you that that uh, you know what I use in in the treatment setting is the response of my staff. You know, when somebody loves somebody, if that's the staff member that loves that personality disorder, we know we're going to have more problems than just the addiction. It's really true. Uh, would the yeah, people yeah. just go, oh, one of the one of those again, or oh, high probability of bipolar if she likes Dr. Blum. You know, it's just, it's just, that's a really interesting instrument, which is the instrument of the self and our own bodies and how we respond to humans. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting you should say that. The, those of us who study psychopathy talk about this phenomenon, and we're all scientists, so I want everything to be math and, and evidence-based, but there is a phenomenon that if you are in the room, with a psychopath, you have a visceral response, a dangerous psychopath, not your pro-socials. And yeah. I have it every time. I can hear a voice. I had one occasion where I just heard someone's voice and I almost peed the floor. I, had the, I was at a TJ Maxx and, I, and then I saw him and he had the crazy eyes. There is something biological in us, innate, that we know this person is maybe not safe or this person is different from me. And it's, I don't know how it's passed on through, you know, whatever mitochondrial DNA or DNA itself, but we do have that gut. 
and the gut does inform us. I mean, even in regular medicine right now, they're saying, listen to the mom. Mm -hmm. The mom's picking up on mm -hmm. stuff. Listen to your gut. You know, listen to the, per the, the human factor as much as you do the scientific stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think these, these in, you know, we just goes under the general rubric of intuition, right? These intuitive sort of phenomenon, I think are very powerful and very important and, and still needs further study. Cause I, like I said, that's it, in that interpersonal neurobiological stuff, but it, it needs a lot more work and people are working on it. Susan, I wonder if you have any questions that we've been rolling on here. You, you seem attentive. How do we not make our kids psychopaths? Well, yeah, listen to her podcast. The podcast <laughs> is how not to make a psychopath. But go ahead, Michelle. There, it, it depends on what kind of. So you can't not make them a psychopath, but you can make them not a serial killer. Um, and it depends on what problems there are. Like if you can take a conduct disorder child and give them biofeedback, and you'll see almost immediate, like maybe after thirty sessions. You'll see the brain rewires. You'll have more gray matter in the important parts of the prefrontal cortex. There are things, we're more neuroplastic than we appreciate. There was that whole adage yeah. like, oh, your brain stops growing at age five. It's not. I mean, the, the most dangerous area that you can have damage, the prefrontal cortex, doesn't stop fully developing in men until they're around 26. Like that is, I mean, that's on the far end, but it really is into your 20s. No, so, no. I, I, yeah, it's well into the twenties. I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's well into the twenties. I, for sure, for it's years. obvious. I know I'm waiting for mine to really kick in, but, <laughs> but, it's a, and, but, but it is, you know, I, I, for instance, you know, my medical training, I couldn't really get my shit together till I was older. I couldn't, I couldn't do the work, and then all of a sudden, I could do the work, and and, it was, and I'm convinced there was a biological shift that made it possible, and I could really engage then, but I just couldn't before. I couldn't focus. I, could, I don't know what the hell was going on, and. And any any man after the age of thirty five will tell you. Mike Catherwood and I used to say this. We when we were doing Love Land. Go, we had, should have been in a cage until we're twenty seven. We should have been like right. isolated from, from you yeah. know, you get, we'll hurt people. We're, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Susan, you think and there's that's a lot of stuff you start in, in childhood that it's not medication. It's stuff that like dialectical behavioral therapy. You mentioned that earlier, and that is a therapy that was developed strictly for. Suicidal People Are Borderlines by Marsha Linehan, mm -hmm. I think is how you say her name, mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm. University of Washington. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, but it has an element of mindfulness that you recognize your own emotion. So if you have a kid who's super over emotional, you can talk to your healthcare provider about maybe engaging in some of this dialectical behavioral therapy. It's not going to hurt the kid, you know, and, and right. maybe they won't end up becoming borderline. You can diagnose borderline in teenagers now, which you couldn't. Before. everyone was resistant but anything you treat in childhood is going to have a better outcome than if you wait until they're an adult by the way i'm starting to hear we're seeing a lot more female sociopaths are you uh, is that true or is that just therapists you know or are they are they more likely to come to therapy now or the female they're sociopaths are very to dangerous i mean they're, they're, they're again, more of them coming to therapy yeah than their male uh, counterparts wait. you're recognizing go ahead I couldn't, we couldn't hear what you said though. Last couple statements, it blocked. I know, and we have this delay. Um, a female yeah. psychopath is far more powerful and far more dangerous than her male counterpart. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and this is because- yeah, watch, watch killing, is, killing Eve. Killing Eve, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. exactly. It's, um, you know, someone told me once that a, uh, the most powerful person on the planet is a beautiful, smart woman without guilt. And that person could take it down a country. <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly hurt a lot of people, but but and so you were you were going to say because they're most they're more dangerous because as women and, and and you know I'll get shot down for this, but we do have social obligations and biological phenomena that do occur. We tend to be a little bit more empathetic. We tend to nurture a little bit more. Whatever's driving that. So in order for a person, a, a, a woman to overcome those tendencies that have evolved throughout time, their psychopathy is deeper, darker. Otherwise, it can be balanced out by just some of these other things that are happening. And I, that's not to say that, that psychopathy changes. When, when you see a full female psychopath in her glory, she has overcome everything, every protective factor that a woman might have based on other genes. 
to to really dampen that that tendency towards psychopathy. So when you see one in her glory, and they're my favorite, um, it's yeah. you, you don't mess with them. Uh, and people are asking, "What is Killing Eve?" It's a Hulu show, I think. It's on Hulu, or it was a. It was actually a British show. I think it went on what network did it go on? But you can see it on Hulu. It's about a very interesting psychopathic female who's a who's a who's a assassin. And uh, yeah, well, antics yeah, ensue. Yeah, yeah, antics ensue. Um, uh, and. Particularly the first season, I thought was really well done in terms of how they presented her psycho psychopathic tendencies. There's an article called, um, it says, uh, I'm a psychopath and what everyone gets wrong about it. And this is a female psychopath who was diagnosed years ago, is um, happy with it, is totally accepting of her diagnosis. The second, and by the way, we say diagnosis, we really can't. It's been taken out of the DSM because of reasons mm -hmm. that it it's hard to disentangle it from antisocial personality disorder. That's a different podcast. Right, right. But she said right. that Killing Eve was the first time she'd seen psychopathy portrayed in not a completely murderous negative light. And I thought it was really interesting, at least for me studying it, to read what she's written. She could tell, she's a professor. She said, the second I told anybody that I'm a psychopath or a sociopath, they would distance themselves from me. They don't want to be on papers with me anymore don't want to publish with me any anymore. And I thought to myself, huh, we need to change that narrative. But the narrative is changing, partially because of, you know, medium like media, media differences like movies and TV shows. We are seeing a shift. And that's why more women are popping up. We're recognizing what it looks like in women. It looks different than it does in men in, in a lot mm. of instances. But it's to have to give a voice to psychopathy for someone to admit it and then write a book about it, and then write an article that comes across my desk, that shift is what I'm hoping we will start seeing, because then you'll see it in your children, and then you won't be afraid to talk about it, and then you'll nudge them into pro-social behavior. And then my job is done. Right, Could be, uh, right. because they they can be, the, the, psych, the, the term sounds so scary and negative, it doesn't have to be that way. That, that there's plenty of learned phenomenon that they can accommodate these particular unique qualities. This is what I've always said about mental health, mental illness. Stop, stop thinking about it. It's all bad. It's, it, there's always assets and liabilities to uh, any difference. All of it, always. What's that, Susan? Yeah. No. Of course, there's a. Everybody has a little of this in them. But um, you know who's a total psychopath is the character on Ozark, the mother. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh God, we just watched the last episode of yeah. that. She. She played it so well. Yeah. Like, right? Isn't that what you're talking about? They're beautiful. Yeah, they're I haven't just, seen the last manipulate. Episode. Yeah, but she's, I mean, she's you know, incredible. The whole series. Yeah. Yeah, no, she, and that would be, she we would call more dangerous. Like, because she can hide under the guise. Susan's got right. it right. She hides under the guise of mother, care, caretaking mother, keeping it all together. But she's the most dangerous snake in the den. Smart and... You know, always has the answer, always looking for the answer, but not thinking about who it's going to hurt. It's pretty interesting. Well, and, and I think the two things that jumped out for me is that because she's not troubled by emotions or anything that might cloud her thinking, she can see things. That other and then her husband see. still loves her. Well, like, they, hang on. That's he, the interesting she, part. She, she can totally ride over him, can roll, steamroll him. And yet he, they're still, they're still deeply connected in some interesting way. What do, what do you make of that, Susan? I don't know. I just think men don't see it, they, you know, if they're in it. Well, he's kind of a sociopath too, right? Yeah, so he who's is. He to I say? mean, he started yeah, it. Who's he to say that she's, oh, you're a sociopath. I can't be with you. He's a sociopath Yeah, too. they're both. The, All I, three of them. Even I, I think what's unusual about girl. I'll tell you why it's. I, we may be so intrigued by it. It's rare to see two psychopaths or sociopaths together. They can't. Usually it's a borderline and a sociopath. <laughs> And and do you see what two psycho sociopaths do? They, it gets pretty wild. Interesting, right? It's so hard for me because Jason Bateman has been my my husband in my mind for since I was a kid. So for me to see him as anything <laughs> other than perfect, I struggle. But right. yes, it's yeah. well. It's he's like a perfect. I'll sorry. give you. He's a perfect. He, he's a perfect actor, and everything I hear about him is he's a perfect guy in real life. But the character is psychopath. So yeah. Right. And, and it's so interesting that those two, like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that movie, you would imagine if your goals align, you're both goal driven because you're psychopaths or sociopaths. If your goals align, that would be a very formidable team like we're seeing in Ozark. 
Yeah. I, 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 a uh, chat comment just came up alongside of you saying that Barry is another one about a, a psychopath. He's sort of a pro-social psychopath. B Barry, have you seen that series, a comedy series about an oh. assassin? Oh, you need to no. watch Barry. It was a while ago. It, it's, but it's back on for another season. Oh, it is? Yes, oh, it's coming cool. back. And I hear the new season is funnier than previous ones. So. I hope it's funny. Um, Dave, Those are, Dave got a little is dark on me. I couldn't deal with it. Dave is about a psychopath, right? Sort of. I think that's kind of, maybe it's more narcissist. But uh, these are all... Okay, what it can't stand her on Ozark, <laughs> great role. I mean, but she you can't played stand that. the you can't stand Laura Linney. You don't think she, she did a good job? She played she the part it. so well. Oh my God! And Some then of the when subtleties. she put herself in the in the rehab or in the yeah. hospital to manipulate her kids to come yeah. back, and yeah. then said she was going to kill her husband, her dad, and then oh my God, they the way that they all just manipulated each well, other. Well, what I was watching is, and this is the impossible thing that Laura Linney did as an actress. The small muscles on her face. If you watch that second to last episode, they come in on her face a lot where she's reacting to some some really interesting, complicated things. And you can see the different things flashing across her right. face in ways that are, you, you, it's hard to think of those things. You know, it's very interesting. I was worried about the actors and actresses that are, I worried about what's her name that played, uh, what was the one in Killing Eve? Um, Villanelle. I was like, eh, she's too good of a psychopath. Kind of worried about her. <laughs> she, she I know. Okay? It, it takes a special person to be able to play those parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's well, true. The, it's even the Villanelle thing. Was, acting the face, just slight movements, micro micro expressions. They're called. Yes. To tell a story. Yes. Yes. It's good acting. Oh my god. And and the Villanelle thing it was more about the flat. She did the flat really well. No reaction to stuff. And and you know more humor and things. But Laura Linney was there was a, a, some sinister feelings coming along and some touching feelings if she really was having them. But you're not sure. And so it's really crazy sure. making. Really, I mean, and I, Drew, that's, that's one know. of the reasons I study psychopathy in children is because you got to capture them before they become really good like that. They will fake emotion so well. That I literally walk out of the prison each time and be like, no, that person didn't do that. I'm like, I get duped by the psychopath way more than I should admit. And I'm like, am I just this yeah. dumb and untrainable? I'm like an untrainable goldfish that I fall for this every freaking time, but they become so good. Yeah. It, it's what the like borderlines that get under your skin too. They, they just, can, they just find their way they get there they know how to do it and, and it's it's i my uh nurse who liked the sociopath used to do this she'd I'd walk in the unit she she put the antennas on her head and she'd go the borderlines antennas are up they know you're here they're they're starting to spin there's you know they're getting into everybody's they're, they're projecting their projective identification is getting out into everybody else's bodies it's it's nasty or challenging so let's <laughs> i'm cutting them out of my life like um i have all these contractors that i've worked with over the years and I'm working on my house right now. And I was just like, I just can't. This one I didn't hire, and this somebody else hired him to come. I just like, I can't have him here anymore. Well, just I'll stop, you, stop bringing him over. What so, she, her, um, her yeah, internet I'm cutting. seems to have gone out, but she's. it looks like she's reconnecting. Okay, we'll get her back. But it's just so funny because I'm like, I can't. I, I'm telling another contractor this, like, please don't send this person over anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't have him at my house. I don't, he's so manipulative and I just don't trust him and he lies. And you know, you well, just, and I wanna, you get to a certain point. And that could point. be a lot of things, but, but there's some, I want to tell Michelle, cause there's something you specifically have zeroed in on that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, if she comes back, we don't know. How's it looking, Caleb? Well, I don't like, I, I know when somebody has a borderline personality, so. Well, you just, you have gotten very sensitive to. I've been burned so many times. It's just like, I, I'm so protective but of you've you gotten, and me. And, you, you, yes, you are. And it, it's to a. To a because I used to be horrible right. at it. Right. It's not, you're quite good at it. I used, to, I used to attract sociopaths so easily. And now at least I can pinpoint them yes. when they come and, into and the she, room. And Susan has become very sensitive to splitting behaviors. Yeah. I'm, when yeah, she sees I'm, splitting, she immediately. Oh yeah. I'm just you know, done. I'm like, come on. Yeah. And I do it too, but. Um, <laughs> you split people? Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, I find split? myself in the middle of stuff and then I'm like, okay, this is not going in the right direction. But um, I was just telling him that I'm. I have contractors that I've worked with over the years and I've gotten to the point now where like if somebody ends up working for me uh, because somebody else hired him and I, I, they start doing the splitting behavior and they're sociopathic and or, or I just cut it off. I'm just like, is, nope, really. that's yeah. it. I'm not doing this, you know, cause I've, yep. it's happened so many times and I do attract sociopaths. That's my biggest problem. Yep. Really? Well, and I, I think, you know, I have a question. Yes, she does. Yes. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so uh, this was related to what you were saying right before you got disconnected. Um, I had read before that you were one of the first scientists to ever identify these potential future predatory behaviors in a population of children. And so I was just mm. wondering, it's like, what is the youngest age that you've actually been able to identify a person with those markers? And are, are you ever able to do anything about it to help them? So How that's from a study. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is every parent's anxiety. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if my, my eight month old can have it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's where my fears go. He's uh, like, my baby is. So that was from a study we did when I was uh, at USC. It's actually what my dissertation was on. And we used nine to 11 year olds. And we had so many of them, thousands and thousands and thousands of regular population, because we knew we'd get one out of 100 would have psychopathic features. And the reason we use that age is because, yes, you can see those traits even younger than nine years old, but we can measure it once the kid is articulate enough, the caregivers can give proper caregiving reports and the, the child is not quite into puberty yet. We want to capture them before they start behaving so badly that they're actually breaking rules. There's an argument that once you start committing crimes, your brain changes. So the reason we chose that population is they're old enough to tell us what they're feeling and what they're thinking or not feeling and thinking, old enough to have shown that to their caregivers and their teachers and their parents, but not old enough to recognize, oh shit, I gotta lie about that. I have to fake that feeling and not old enough right. to be in puberty and crimes. How, how old do you imagine is the earliest it could be identified? Probably. I think this is a guess. Probably. I th it's a guess. It's a guess. I think because yeah. aren't young, aren't toddlers psychopaths? I mean, aren't they just by nature selfish? Yeah. Free? Yeah. They're primary narcissists. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Yeah. So I, and, I and, and they're borderline. They use a lot of projective identification. You know, they cry and it gets under your skin and it makes you, they, that's how they get their needs met. Right. And it's never their fault. It's always somebody else's fault, like mm -hmm. a borderline. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would say once mm -hmm. that they, they can articulate and speak about their lack of feelings and then, you know, watch them around the family cat. Yes. A toddler is going to start being mean to it, but watch when the toddler starts really enjoying it, enjoying being mm -hmm. mean to their pet. Mm -hmm. so that's always a big, I mean, that's a, that's harbinger that's a for a lot of bad stuff, but yeah. yeah, I would say once in a while, Who, uh... you know, preschool, kindergarten age. Did you see the other, I think it's also a Hulu series about um, the woman that uh, headed up that billion dollar uh, lab company. Susan, what was oh, that called? Uh, yeah. Say Theranos. Less. The Dropout. The Dropout. Oh, the Dropout. Yeah, Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. And in that series, they hinted at her being a psychopath. They, they had her a couple times saying, you know, I think I'm not normal. I, I don't feel what normal people feel. I don't feel anything she was saying. And it's not, you know... So do you think she was a psychopath? I don't know enough, of, enough about her. Um, I know what she did. Um, I, want, I want to follow, I want to see actual interviews with her because I've just read the court cases and I've read the accusations because yeah. she could just be a gifted narcissist. She, her yeah. victims were mainly financial at that point. So it's, yes. it's yes. a little bit, it's hard, it, it, it's a little amorphous, but if we watch her, Drew, in these interviews, we could probably parse it out. Interesting. Let's get a call, see what Josh... Um, wait, yeah. can you define splitting? Oh, people... Doing? Hang on a second, Josh. So splitting is essentially... Splitting has lots of different elements to it. Some people theorize that people internally feel split. There's a good self and a bad self, that they see the world as all good or all bad. But that's the, not what we're talking about. The splitting we're talking about is how people get their needs met. They go, I go, you know, I'm I'm Susan's kid. And I go, mommy, I want some ice cream. And you go, no. Daddy, mommy's mean to me. Can I have some ice cream? You know, it's just, it's splitting one against the other. It's a bl putting blame over here. And it, it can take all kinds of, you're mom, you're the best mom in the world. I bet you'd give me, dad's mean to me. I bet you would give me some ice cream. You know, it's this kind of, would you, am I getting it, Michelle? Am I getting at it uh, enough? I think in borderlines, it can even be with the, the splitting refers to how they idealize somebody at first and yeah. then they villainize yeah. them. They, they, yeah, that's the all that, good, all bad stuff. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. that's you're that's the all good or all bad. Splitting when you're talking about a borderline, that's the splitting you're talking about is everyone in their life yeah. starts idealized and then they fall off that pedestal and then they're a demon. There's no gray area, like you said. It's all black and white. Right. 
and and physicians fall victim to this all the time. This is how the opioid epidemic got going, which is you're the best doctor ever. Only you know how to control me. Everyone else has been terrible. You figured it out. And then you're the best doctor. You gratify them. And then if you realize you've, you've fallen into something, you try to pull back. You're the worst. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to tell everybody how horrible you are. And there's the internal split. Susan, can't hear you. Can you mic's off? Oh, and then they go. do tell everybody how horrible. Oh you are. yeah. Oh, they'll act and it out. And then they make emails and they make oh, phone calls. And, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I yeah, and I just you know I don't like being in the middle of that. Like I just go, <laughs> okay, that's got to stop. So no, nobody likes being in the middle of that. But but it happens. It happens in work environments commonly, and it's yeah. it's, a, it's a regressive behavior, and and almost anybody can can be prone to it in a if they if they sort of are stressed enough. When people feel threatened, they kind of regress in terms of their strategies of you know getting their needs met or managing their situation in the right. workplace and there's actually there's you know human behavioral economic studies about you know at what point does splitting behaviors begin in a given system how you know the test the health of a of a workplace environment by seeing at what point splitting emerges it's interesting josh you have a question yeah um i just uh, really enjoyed this conversation i wanted to go back to the uh, earlier part of the program when you were talking about conscience, because I feel like that's the big thing that is sort of lacking um, in sociopathy. Mm. And what makes me go there is because it's not that I have like some strange theory, but <laughs> I, I like to think of um, everyone sort of having some kind of conscience. And I think it could be extreme in the sociopaths. Uh, part extreme one way or the other and for I think I guess my question is is I want to know if if they get triggered I want to know if something happens where they have a, a, an upsurge of envy and all of a sudden the normal or neurotic person becomes psychopathic and um, the reason I think this happens is because the restriction placed upon them by their own conscience is so immensely strong that they can't live in that caged world and they break out of it, cast off their super ego, cast off their conscience and become psychopathic and lose all sense of right and wrong. Okay. That's my question. Okay. I, I have a little theory about that. Michelle, go ahead. I think that you can see people who aren't technically psychopathic behave in psychopathic ways under certain right. circumstances and right. certain triggers but a true psychopath right. isn't going to go back and forth and and one of the typical phenomenon where in in circumstances in which we see that phenomenon is behavior with an out group you if you have an in group and an out group people can treat the out group in such a way as as dehumanizing them marginalizing them, torturing them. If you have a full, this, this is something I've, I've seen in the literature, which is out-group behavior, if it's strong enough, like, you know, what did Stalin do to the out-groups? What did Nazis do to the out-groups? And, and not feel guilt or shame because these really aren't humans. What did they do to the Jews? They weren't humans. First thing to do is dehumanize. Then you can do anything you want to them. And the behavior is psychopathic with that out-group. Does that make sense? I think that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So it really isn't a psychodynamic thing. It's almost it's and it's almost like the fundamental attribution error. It, error. It's the circumstance that creates that stuff and not the internal phenomenon. And that's what we see with drug addicts too. They start acting psychopathic. You know, they start exactly um, lack of functions. Yeah, it's when people's survival is in question. You know, they feel their survival is threatened, and and to, and Josh's point to some extent, envy is one of those things that that creates that uh, maybe, but but not so much. It's really danger, and and you know, then maybe the phenomenon of how you get there is you unleash your usual social constraints. I mean, I guess that's true, and you can think about that as an ego super ego thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's the circumstance and, and the fundamental attribution error though, that really sets it up. Seems to me, Michelle, we got to wrap this thing up. It's been great to talk to you today in all the different settings we have spoken. Um, and tell them again, the podcast, where they get it, tell them about what you, any, anywhere you want to send them. Now's the time. Instagram, Dr. Yeah. Michelle Ward, two L E. Yep. And the podcast. The, well, the one I, I want to talk about with you is this How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. I do have another one called The Mind of a Monster, um, but 
this one is uh, covers the topics we were talking about today. So how not to raise a serial killer. And you can get it on all the platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. And do they come out every week or they just, you have a series of yes. them? How's that uh, situated? Every Tuesday we get a and new crime talk- and I bring in a mom. So the mom and I go through the crime and then we talk about what could have been done to possibly prevent that crime and what you can do at home to make sure your kids, it's not just preventing them from being a killer. It's just information about raising a decent kid altogether. Are you saying the Where mom of the serial the killer? No, just a mom. Where- a mom. Oh, a mom. Okay. Is, I was it, like, it's, wow. it's just Caleb's a mom. afraid. Yeah. And where do you, where do you get the moms? Well, so friends, far I've been bringing in all right in. I've been friends. bringing in all my friends. Susan, you want to be? They have been tortured for true crime forever. And Susan, you, I would like Susan to come on because I think she'd have a lot of good insight. Yeah, and there's certainly you you hear that the the um, filtration of her thoughts will be spontaneous there will be, be no <laughs> yeah. filtration <laughs> so, yeah i don't awesome. have any filter yeah i don't know if you guys noticed that <laughs> so which is terrific <laughs> uh all right well we thank you and we hope the best success i, I didn't realize that you invited a mom and that's and a i would love to come on your show yeah it's a brilliant way to do it I, I really see how that would create a community and that makes perfect sense to me that's a, that that's a nice twist to this so uh, keep doing it, and you, should, and you should have like contests and let people write in to come in, and you can zoom them in now. You know, people are used to zooming in, in pods and things, so you should do that. Yeah, people are very she's going to manage your career. I'm just saying. I, I wish just, she would. Uh, I'd be a lot more successful <laughs> if Drew managed my career. <laughs> That's one thing he hasn't done yet. That should be your next career, Drew. To be a manager, managing doctors and in, in their uh, podcast. I, I, I like I like um, deploying doctors and 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 talents i i, think I know that, we love we love yeah. having doctors on and yeah. seeing them bloom yeah. blossom into full-time mm-hmm. media giants mm-hmm. we, we wish thank wish you. for that thank you guys. <laughs> well not only that i i have you know felt for a long time that the the scientists the clinicians you know are not representative enough in media you know it, it's it's all attorneys and politic political pundits yeah we're, we're trying to get dr but Jay Bhattacharyan to write a book. Bhattacharya. Yeah, about his a, life. Was harmed. so that we have this in the history books. Yeah, you know. Yeah. This whole COVID nineteen debacle. I'm looking at the restream guys, uh, and which we're gonna have a lot of sociopaths coming out of. I'm sure. Do we? I'm sure we're gonna have something bad come out of it. Out of our restream? No, out of the the COVID-19 oh, experience, oh, yeah. the Who kids knows? are gro- growing up Any theory about what's going to happen to the middle teenage years as a result of being locked down and out of school all those years? That's the group I worry about. My biggest concern is the time spent on social media, you know, when, when they yeah. didn't have that, that yeah. in-person interaction, that that's my biggest concern is because we know how dangerous yeah. that is psychologically. And once you, once you're doing it so often, it's really hard to undo it. It's an addiction. It, it really could be the whole story in all this. That's true. It's very true. You got to build your new addiction uh, clientele of, of me, uh, me, social media. That'll well, there the will be, generation. there will be, it's called process addiction. There will, there will be a lot of that kind of stuff. I'm sure out there. Uh, Michelle Ward, Dr. Michelle Ward, M A I C H E L L E Ward at uh, Instagram. Uh, find her there and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Michelle Ward, everybody. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And she is a uh, poly parent, Susan. I did not know that. Yes. Uh, nice. They, Good. Yeah. They they ran away to France for several years. I used to use her on HLN all the time. And then all of a sudden Are her she kids was in poly now? Yep. Oh, wow. I, I wanna, why don't you tell me that? I have a couple questions about how they kept, kept the school going and what they, um, if they did all remote work learning. Call, or? When you go on the show. When you go on her show. I'm just always curious. That. You know, yeah. I'm not that invested in my kids' ex community, but I just was curious how yeah. they ran their program. Yeah, they... I, it would be interesting to hear. And, and they're not high school age, I don't think. They're sort of more middle and, and lower school stuff. So, Caleb, thank you for doing this. Um, we are back uh, on Monday? Monday Monday and Tuesday next week. We're going to do Tuesday. it a little differently. Uh, do we have bookings yet for that winter? And who the I think are? so. Caleb, do you know who's coming? You don't coming? know who? Uh, know I'm not sure. Not on my calendar. Uh, Monday okay, and Tuesday, have, the 16th uh, and 17th. Somebody named... 16th, 17th. Oh, within... I saw it. Then um, I am gone for quite some time, potentially. Uh, it's going to get weird, everybody. Wait, I, I can't I really tell you where I'm going, 
but I will be gone until the second week of June. Well, maybe, maybe. but we're going to go to Austin, 18th and 19th, and yes. 20th. So. And we might come back from Austin. You know, I could. You probably... could do a show on Wednesday, just an ask or something. I'm getting my, I have to get my hair done. So. An ask. What you can do it. At? You'll have to do it without me. I can do that. And I could. And then we, we can meet at the airport and at we four probably o'clock. And probably could do it on Monday the 23rd, too. Probably. Maybe. We'll see. And and I could bring a camera with me to where I'm going. No, you're not. Gonna, okay. All right. I didn't think so. Uh, I'm doing a bunch of. Cola well, you haven't. There. It's not in stone yet. No, it is so not in stone yet. It is it might not be so here. But but there is a possibility that Hollywood. That this I, is how it feels to work in Hollywood. Yeah, that I will. I be might here. have it, and I might not. And Monday I'm and gonna, Tuesday, then we go to Austin to do After Dark for. I'm excited three days. about it if it happens. Yeah, and then Gonzo possibly for three weeks, essentially. People so, were going going on about um, Amber Heard in the in the Johnny Depp thing. And yeah. Because we're talking about, you know, sociopaths and psychopaths and yeah. alcoholics. No, she, and- did a, she did us, a, she has done a huge, uh, Michelle told us, we, she and I did another podcast and she said that we both agree that she has done a huge community service. This is a huge community service about really how people with these disorders use cudgels, use these things to destroy people that are well-meaning and well-intentioned and good things like Me Too. And that yeah, kind why of didn't we talk about them? That would have been a good... Because that you got to go listen to the other podcast. Okay, so if you want to hear about... Th- that's in two months. Nobody's going to care by then. Mm. Um, mm. But anyways, it's right now, it, it goes back and forth. Like, I've only listened to a little bit of it, but mm-hmm. um, I think that you know, every day it turns on the other person, whoever side it is. And it's just, it, it's just so, so overwhelming to think mm-hmm. how much drama was going on in their relationship and, yeah. and how they were, you know, isolated. And she was, she was just putting up with this and very sick in different ways. Yeah. Very sick in different ways. And, and to try to, to try to, this is again, back to my thing about mental illness. But dealing with an alcoholic or drug addict is really hard. Yeah, and, and if you've got a personality disorder, it's even harder. That's right. And if you already have trauma and stuff, and this guy's getting scary on you, yeah. you're re-traumatized, and then you go into sort of survival mode, and then things get exactly. crazy. Exactly. Uh, that's yeah. what happened. To no, me. I I don't like the fact that people are getting into this one's right, this one's wrong, this one's good, this one's bad. But it, pulling the lid off this and looking it's, at it is the, a very important. The case thing. is about defamation and mm-hmm. whether or not. She ruined his career with words that right. were not correct, and, That's ha- right. and and his he doesn't believe that he was a wife beater, but I don't know if he can really describe wife beating as just beating your wife. Like it could be, you know, <laughs> right, doing right. crazy things sexually and right. and being really weird when you're drunk and abusive, or, and ju- or just scary, making, aggressive, yeah, and, you know, scary. and giving her battered women syndrome mm-hmm. and making her feel like she has to stay and you know then he gets sober and he's nice again and then he forgive she forgives him and then he gets drunk again and right. then it's the cycle starts all over it's again it's very complicated but i feel like it's you know what she wrote was such a shock you know to you know his career and it's good that he's fighting but well, it's that time reason. that people took account are held to accountability for things they say about yeah, other people. Yeah, we have to be super When you careful harm about other people with things you say that are even half-truths, you harm and you intend to harm, come on. Just take half the money and go. You know what I mean? Don't right. don't completely cut them off at the knees. Although, you know, he's he's got, like, like I said before, if she had just reported that what a horrible drug addict and alcoholic he was, he would never have lost his job at Disney. I, I'm watching you guys on the restream. Thank you, Miss Salsa, for saying that I respond to your stuff. I try to respond to stuff when I see it or if it can be responded to. Some of the things people put down there either don't have time to read or they don't really have a question. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, we're gonna let this go. We're gonna break. We're gonna. I mean, I don't know the whole case, so I can't really yeah, of say not. a lot. But right, I not, do, that's not our job. I do feel bad for both of them. I do too. All right, we're gonna stop right here, and we are gonna see you back on Monday at uh, three o'clock. We will see you then. Ta-ta. Somebody hand me some dollar bills, mm. right? That was like this. Yes. <laughs> and why didn't you have those last night? <laughs> Did you get them back? I'm not saying anything. I'm just I'm wondering if that, that all looks familiar to you. So you had that, and what you did do I that? have this? Did I not <laughs> throw this? You had that, but go ahead. And what happened? But to why it? do you have it now? Because I'm in Annie's house. Why do you think? <laughs> it's like... Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. 
This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help. 